Welcome to another episode of Real Talk with Terry, and I'm your host, Terry Cato. I'm here in San Francisco at the 96th Annual Freedom Fund Gala hosted by the San Francisco branch of the NAACP. I will be interviewing guest speakers, keynote speakers, and other VIPs and dignitaries tonight. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Thank you. I'm sitting here with Dr. Amos Brown, the president of the San Francisco chapter of the NAACP. And Dr. Brown, I wanted to know, the work of the NAACP is as relevant now as it was over 100 years ago when you guys were founded. And that was primarily to get a handle on or to um, alleviate a lot of the mass lynchings that were happening all over the U.S., but primarily in the South. So what... Um, what are some of the initiatives, the current initiatives, that the NAACP is working on? We are continuing to struggle to fight injustice, which is in the DNA of this nation. And the racism that was stamped from the beginning, to use the words of Dr. Kendi, the thing of treating blacks unjustly, wrongly, lynchings, came from the crazy, silly notion that we were inferior, that we were not human, and could not master self-governance. The NACP has been about rights, yes, but more importantly, to make sure that we are respected. That's what Aretha Franklin said in her song, right. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. So we have sought to gain respect for the black people of this nation since 1909 in order that we might have quality education, that we might have fair opportunities for housing, economic empowerment, jobs, and respect for our culture, and not seeing us as being descendants from the assholes as that man who's at 1600, so ignorantly elected to call us, those of us who are from the Caribbean islands and from Africa. So the struggle goes on, it's still here, and we have a resurgence of it because Mr. Trump has given the signal and has stirred up the alt-right, it all comes from an attitude and what's in the heart. And this man has nothing but contempt for black people and is only concerned about materialism, militarism, and racism. Thank you. And one more question. You uh, talked about the resurgence of violence against black people primarily. Um, and there are movements that have kind of come around that the Black Lives Matter, some of the other movements. What I want to know, because the NAACP is a well-respected organization that's been around for over 100 years, and you have a proven track record of success. What I want to know is, how can we bridge the gap between some of the younger organizations, such as the Black Lives Matter movement, with the NAACP, an organization that's well-respected and that's been around and ha that has a proven track record? How can the two of these organizations work together because it, we're fighting for some of the same things. We must work in together. It's not optional. Right. In Mississippi, where I came from, there's an old adage that you never hook up two young mules to ply by themselves. Absolutely. Neither do you hook up two old mules right. to ply by themselves. You always hook up an old mule and a young mule if you want to have successful plowing. And I think that all we need to do is just hook up with each other. Absolutely. No one has all the answers. We must see that this movement has always been intergenerational. I organized the first youth council of NACP at the age of 14 in my hometown of Jackson, Mississippi. Wow. After, unfortunately, Emmett Till was murdered. And I went to Mr. Mega Evers, whose image is on this program tonight, and told him how upset I was about what those two white men did 
Emmett Till, who was the same age as I was then. And he said to me, Amos, don't just be mad. Be smart. Let's organize a youth council so we will be able to teach your young friends how to fight this evil of racism and injustice in a smart way. Absolutely. And in 1956, Mr. Evans brought me to the National Convention of NACP here in San Francisco, wow. where I first met Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., who, parenthetically, let me say, was my teacher. He taught only one class in his lifetime, and I was one of the eight students at Morehouse College in 1962. Well, I came to that convention, and I met Dr. King. He spoke for Youth Night. He was only 26 years old when he began to lead this movement for justice. And I met A. Phil Randolph, a great labor man, Walter Ruther, the AFL-CIO, Roy Wilkins, who was then the executive sector of the organization. So personally, I can say, I've always had respect for my elders. And I never felt that I knew it all. Right. I hung around them, I went to the meetings, and I made sure that I was able to extract from their conversations and from their presence those virtues and those principles awesome. that will enable us to fight this demon of race in America awesome. in a smart way. I like that. Thank you. That's yeah. I like the way that I like that analogy. Yeah. You don't plow with the old mule, two old mules and yeah. two young mules. I yeah. like that because the younger mule needs the wisdom yeah. of the old mule right. and the old mule obviously needs the strength right. of yeah. the younger mule and that's a great analogy for the Young Black Lives Matter movement and the NAACP. I see the two, one old and wise, one young and strong, you yeah. both need each other. So I hope that in the near future we will see more collaboration and working together because we're all fighting for the same thing and that's silver Rights. And also, we must remember, old folks don't have monopoly on truth and wisdom. Right. Jesus was only 33 years old. Absolutely. Dr. King was only 26, as I said earlier. Absolutely. But what we must see is that it's more of a likelihood that those who've been in the struggle a long time mm -hmm. have a longer perspective and deeper understanding Right. of the ways of this system right. so that we must complement each other Absolutely. and work as a dream team. I like that. Thank you so much. You thank heard you. that we must work as a dream team. I would like to thank you, Dr. Amos. Thank, thank you, you for the work for the that you're doing. Absolutely. Thank you for the work that you're doing in the community. And thank you for having us out. And I wish you well. I know this is going to be a lovely event. Thank well, you. We're looking forward to it tonight. Awesome. Thank you again. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you. I have the pleasure of sitting with Mr. Tony Wagner, who is chairman of the board for Sutter Health. Welcome to Real Talk with Terry. Thank you so much for being here. I'm excited about the event, and I'm excited that um, Sutter Health is a partner with the event, a sponsor. So what I wanted to know, or what I would like for you to share with the viewers, as I understand, you have some concerns with housing in San Francisco and just kind of um, what I read was almost the mass exodus of especially yes. millennials from the area. What are your thoughts on that and perhaps what can San Francisco do to perhaps slow that exodus down? It's a, it's a very difficult question to have a really a definitive answer, mm -hmm. uh, Terry. But it is my concern that uh, with now we're down about 4.7 percent of the population and, and still the exodus is going, and the cost of housing is so exorbitant. Um, our people, and not just our people, but most uh, young people can't afford to live here. I have two adult sons. They both have homes, but they live it, and they were born here uh, in our family home. They can't afford to live here. They live in Oakland. Uh, but uh, one of them works here in the financial district, the other one, works for one of our Sutter hospitals in Oakland. So they can't afford to live here. And I think that's a major problem for us. 
when you consider what the population when we moved here was. Okay, that you bring up some great points. And what I would want to know, I'm actually a transplant. I've been here since 2011, so I'm still learning. From to, where? From Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm, I'm still learning the dynamics of San, the San Francisco Bay Area. What is driving the cost of housing? What, what is driving this? I mean, I'm still learning. What's driving it's it? It's supply and demand. Got it. The uh, supply is very meager. The demand is great. And the ability to pay is great. On my block, uh, uh, about six months ago, a house across the street from me sold for $2.2 million, and it was cash. That's, that is being repeated all over the city. Right. And when you have that kind of activity going on, it's very hard to compete with it. So it seems like there's a there's a bigger divide now between perhaps the haves and the have-nots. Oh. The people that can pay two point one million or two over two million dollars cash for a house yes. versus those who can. Yes. So it's, there just seems to be a bigger divide. It's not just a divide, it's a chasm. Yes. <laughs> So, so, so what? So, what are some things? It's kind of hard. I know it's a it's a complex problem, and I know not just San Francisco, but down in San Jose, Oakland, um, with revitalization and um, urbanization, are going through similar issues or yes. having similar problems. Um, what are some things that perhaps the municipalities, or I don't know, what what could what well, could they do to you, you help know, this? Well. One of the things that can do, the municipalities can do, is create uh, lower income housing mm. for, I mean, you can start with our teachers. Right. Teachers have a very low salary, have, have housing to subsidize for them. Uh, you could, you could uh, and this would be a, a two-pronged problem we're solving. We could demand more that our, uh, our fire folks and our police live in the city and then actually provide housing mm -hmm. that they can live here. Right. Um, I recently chaired the board for a uh, uh, low-income housing development in the Western Edition that our church sponsors. And um, that's another source of housing awesome. that we can. And the mayor... Uh, Breed is doing all she can is to create new housing stock for the city. Okay. But it, it's, it's, it's a very intractable problem. Right, it's a tough problem. It's really hard. It's a tough problem. But I know that um, I've been following this and I know that Mayor Breed is doing some things. She I know is. that a proposition was just passed to get more funding yes. for um, homelessness to help combat the homelessness yes. problem. But um, but it's a hard problem very to overcome. So, so there's another issue, I, as I understand that you're very passionate about and one that you see happening and that is the concern or the loss of young people in the church or in, in with their Christian faith and I actually read a very interesting article about millennials and the younger generation and their need or what they feel their lack of need for church and they feel like they are not they are religious or am I saying this right they're they're, spiritual. that's it you got it but, yes, but, but not but absolutely. they don't go to church yes that's what I'm trying to say there's something that you gain mm -hmm. by fellowshipping with fellow uh, believers I, I'm not a conservative as far as my Christian faith goes but with the stressors that we have in our world today Sometimes the only thing that you can hang on to is your faith. And it's very difficult to do that by yourself. It, it really is. And so what our millennials and my sons, they were brought up in the church, they don't come from uh, Sunday night, and they have grandchildren. I have grandchildren now, three grandchildren. Uh, what, what they're forgetting is what brought us over the same thing can bring them over. Absolutely. All right. and, and so I, I and, and it's just not the black church. It's just, it's that generation of all ethnic groups. They, they're just not 
interested. Right. I think the church has a great responsibility. Absolutely. Though. They can't continue to do the things the way they used to do right. them. They have to address the millennials, the young people, where they are. Right. And so it's almost bringing them up to this point and us going to this point and coming together. Bridging the gap. Yes. Yeah. So to speak, bridging the gap. Because yes. there's um, that whole generation is missing from the church, the millennials. Yes. And, and my question is, how much of that do you feel is perhaps the church's fault? Oh, a huge part, a huge part of Absolutely. it. Absolutely. I mean, if, if a church, all they're doing is, is I'm talking about black church guys, they're preaching and shouting on Sunday, and that's all they do, they haven't addressed anything, uh, the needs, uh, the social needs of our generation. Uh, there are a lot of churches who think that, that there should be a separation of church and politics. I don't. I think, actually, Jesus was involved in politics uh, with, with the uh, issues of the day, uh, of the, uh, the uh, Jews and the, the Roman authorities. So. We, we shouldn't separate them, but we have become so rigid and so ridiculous in some of the preachments that, that are in our churches. It turns young people off, and I understand that. So I think a huge part of the problem is the church. Got it. I understand. I'm actually a church goer. Uh, are and you really? I, I am. I attend church and was raised in the church and have been researching this myself. And one of the things that um, I found in my research is that they said that the young people are falling away from the church is because they don't feel included. And it's something key when you said they don't feel like the church is doing enough to address social issues in the community. Absolutely. And the younger generation coming up, they're very concerned about social issues and how the church Church is meeting those needs in the yes. community, and do they feel a part of the community? And that's one of the things exactly. that they have overwhelmingly said is that they don't feel a part of the church community. So I do. I think the church has a huge responsibility to bring our young people back and to get them involved and to do more in terms of social engagement. So you bring up some good points. Getting out of the four walls of the sanctuaries. You know, you spend two hours at church. When really the church should be out the rest of those hours in the community. Absolutely. And too many churches don't do that. You're right. You're absolutely right. So I want to thank you for coming, and it's been a pleasure talking to you. Likewise. And thank you, and this is going to be a lovely evening. It has been so far, so have a great evening. Thank you And very thank much. you again for the work that you're doing in the Bay Area. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. I have Dr. Rennell Brooks Moon with me and I'm excited to interview her. She has a very non-traditional career. She is one of only what two female announcers for a professional baseball team and you received the an award from the um, Baseball Hall of Fame, right? For your well, the work that you do. I was recognized by the Hall of Fame in 2002. Yes. Um, when we were in the World Series against the Anaheim Angels, at which time I became, and I didn't know this until they came and told me, the first woman to announce a professional championship game in any major professional wow, sport. Wow, that's I awesome. Know. It's crazy. That is yeah. awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. And I have a background in professional sports as well. As I shared, I used to work for the Arizona Diamondbacks. Division rival. <laughs> so what I want to know, could you just share with the viewers, what advice would you have for a young person that would want to pursue a career like this? Like, what should they do from an educational or a networking standpoint? Because I just know the challenges that I had mm. trying to get a front office job, and it's not easy. No, and it's, then even it's still not easy. And when you get there, yeah. it's still not easy. Exactly. It's hard to even move up, to move over, to do anything. So what advice could you share with our viewers? It's the, it's the advice that I give all of my, my broadcasting students, and it, it, nothing has changed. Okay. Nothing has changed. You, it's still a lot of um, who you know. Absolutely. So I always urge uh, my, my students to connect network and connect there there are a lot of organizations that you can get in, involved with a lot of mentoring organizations it's so much about who you know absolutely but on but beyond that you must be well educated I encourage them to stay in school go to college communication degree a journalism degree and then I also encourage them to uh, reach out 
to people that are doing what you want to do and set up an informational interview. And, and don't be afraid of that because more often than not, people will respond. I do it all the time. I bring young people in all the time, but they will respond. Go in and shadow, have an informational interview, and make connections, stay in touch, and stay persistent because even though now, there are so many more opportunities because there's so many cable stations. Right. When I was young, there were three networks. <laughs> okay, now you can get sports 24-7 anywhere. Right. And also the uh, online as well. So there are a right. lot of opportunities lot now. Opportunities. But you have got to just put yourself out there. Right. Stay persistent. Right. Stay encouraged. Right. And that opportunity will come. But you've got to make sure you are prepared. Why am I pointing? Make sure <laughs> that you are prepared. It's for somebody out there. I'm, just, I'm getting into my thing right <laughs> yes. now. <laughs> Make sure you are prepared and ready to Absolutely. do your homework. Yeah. Absolutely. And and I cannot stress that enough because that was key for me was to stay persistent and to continue following up and making calls to people. And you mentioned education as well. Some people think a, mi a big misconception about working in professional sports mm -hmm. is that you need to be passionate about sports. But you need to be educated and you need to be passionate about whatever, whatever area exactly. you want to work in. Exactly. Because they have human resources people, they have accounting people, there are a of people that work behind the scenes the to make it happen. Office, yeah. The entire front office, which is where I was, the entire front office, those are educated yeah. people with yes. degrees, and they're not necessarily passionate about sports, but they're good at what they do. Exactly, and be open yes. to those other possibilities. Absolutely. You might get a, the way I got into radio, I got an entry-level job in radio, and then all of a sudden I was able to build an on-air career from that, but mm -hmm. I just took that entry-level job, got my foot in the door, Absolutely. so maybe you want to start you know, in the front office and then you can work your way up. Right. So you be open to all the possible. Same thing in broadcasting, behind, behind the scenes. Behind Don't the scenes. worry about just being on the mic or on camera. Like, like you said, there's all kinds of administrative jobs, creative writing jobs and everything. So there are many opportunities and just take advantage of them all. And the more, that's, that's why I loved starting in an entry level position. Mm -hmm. That, I'd gone to college, but that was, you know, on the job Your training. training ground. On the job, and I, I was blessed to learn from the right. best. So. Get out there and work. Exactly. Do what you have to do. If you have to start, and I don't like to say at the bottom, but entry no. level, but you, you learn like to so you much. You start from the bottom, right? And then you're here. Exactly. <laughs> then you get to the top. <laughs> That's right. We started at the bottom. Now, now we're we here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Oh, that it's my was pleasure. Wonderful advice. You are the, our beautiful MC tonight. My honor. Yes, thank for you. For the gala. Thank so you. I know this is going to be a great event. It's going to be very entertaining. It is. I'm excited to enjoy it. So thank you again for sitting down and thank you for your advice to our viewers and have a great evening. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Proud of you. Thank you. <laughs>